see if anybody's in the attendees. So welcome to the Ad Hoc Commission on the Discipline System Fairness Subcommittee Expungement Working Group. It's a mouthful. Um, I am current, we are currently live and I will now check the attendee list to make sure that there's no one in there that's on the committee and there isn't. And so I will take the role. Um, Michelle Anderson, Ray Buenaventura. Present. Sarah Good. Shalon Joseph. Present. Steve Moab. Here. Martin Winfield. Present. All right, we have a quorum. At this time, I would like to take public comment. So if there is anyone that is attending in the public that would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. And it looks like we have a couple members. Um, Mr. Pavone, Ben Pavone, if you would unmute yourself, uh, you have two minutes to make a public comment. Thank you, I appreciate the uh, committee taking in public input as always. I have uh, a bunch of things to say, so I'll do this just as quickly as I can. Um, in terms of uh, marks on the website, um, and having studied this system to some extent over the last about year, um, there's a number of problems with its consumer protection mission in terms of reporting information. One, you know, I've taken in and talked to a large number of people, and what I'm seeing is a lot of cases where there's no particular client harm. So if you're reporting an adverse mark on the website, you're not necessarily serving the consumer protection function um, in terms of what's important to clients. Now, this may be important to the state bar or to OCTC, but you're not necessarily protecting the public just by every single culpability finding in state bar world. Number two, so many of these marks are just objectively not that serious that you end up spotlighting things that are, you know, this, you can remember, this is an official government website. You know, this is like the, the most reliable source of information. We all treat the state bars reporting as sort of the baseline thing to refer to. And by having these marks on there forever, you really emphasize something that is often just not that important relative to things that are much more important that don't get reported. You know, if you're a consumer or a client, you know, you want to know how many times a lawyer goes to trial and wins. That may be very important to you, but you know, what happened to him 10 years ago over some minor thing is just not that important, but it gets spotlighted by the government and it, it harms the consumer protection purpose. Number three, under BMP 6068A, um, OCTC can charge literally anything, anything that falls in uh, as a violation. I'm 15 sorry. seconds, sir. Okay. The unlimited charging discretion of 6068A is a problem. It's too, it's too much discretion. Um, the idea of not having expungement so that you have outdated information, problems the attorney fixed a long time ago is also a problem. And finally, you have what I said is selective prosecution, Girardi and all that. I won't go over okay. that. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clark, you have been unmuted. If you would unmute yourself. You have two minutes. Oh, can you talk now? Making sure. I tried okay. to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. My name is Ditto Clark. My bar number is 79,876. I have three issues. One, I was wrongly convicted of an ex post facto bill of attainder, which impairs the obligations of contract in violation of the US and California constitutions. According to the state bar prosecutor and the state bar court, my offense was continuing to represent a client after the moment the client expressed a desire to substitute attorneys. I did that and it was entirely proper 
pursuant to the attorney-client retainer agreement and state law. And what I did was required by my duty to protect my client from the harm he was certain to suffer if I immediately withdrew from representing him. The bar court found that my violation of their ex post facto bill of attainder constituted representing a client without authority to do so. Second point, next February, the state bar is scheduled to permanently suspend me, which is equivalent to disbarment for inability to pay the state bar's almost $22,000 cost of prosecuting me for an offense I didn't commit. Th number three, I have diligently opposed all of these travesties to no avail. Please help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Clark, and I apologize for getting your name wrong at the beginning. I believe that is all of the public comment at this time. So we will move on to the agenda. Um, I will share my screen. All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint slide? Yes. Okay. So welcome. Thank you for taking your lunch hour and then some to come to this meeting. We have two topics on the agenda today. One is the post-conviction expungement and two is the discipline on the State Bar website. We will first start off with the post-conviction expungement, but I wanted to kind of level set at the beginning here of what we expect to accomplish today. And the goals for today's meetings are kind of a greater understanding of the expungement, what's currently available and possible modifications to the expungement. And then also what is currently on our website and any potential modifications for the length that something remains on the website or removal from the website. Um, I fully expect that we will identify areas of further research. We don't have all the data now, but I would like the um, working group to think about if there are things that they would require to make further decisions, and then also identifying specific areas for recommendations. So if there is a recommendation that we want to remove things off of the website, we may not get into the final details of what exactly offense that we want to remove from the website after what specific amount of time. But if there are specific, if we decide that that's an area that we want to go and explore, um, what kind of, um, you know, just kind of furthering uh, those specific, narrowing those specific areas down is another goal of the meeting today. So I will start off by saying current non-disciplinary expungement. So there is the ability to expunge from the State Bar's attorney profile page currently for administrative actions. And these are actions that if you fail to um, pay your member dues or fall out of compliance with MCLE, you can petition after certain amount of time and certain requirements are met to get that expunged from the website. And those requirements are as follows, that you haven't on any previous occasion obtained expungement, that the suspension that you're trying to expunge, the administrative suspension was 90 days or fewer, and the suspension ended at least seven years prior, so it was on the website for seven years to the expungement um, that is sought, and you have no other record of suspension or involuntary and active enrollment. And so why I bring this up is this is currently what is done, and this could be a template of things and criteria for expungement on the website for um, the criminal side. This is, all the expungement is just recommendations. So the Board of Trustees directs staff to submit to the Supreme Court, but the ultimate decision maker is the Supreme Court, even for these administrative expungements. And so the Supreme Court makes all of the decisions. And so if there are any changes on the criminal side for expungement, they would also need to be made with the Supreme Court. So I have asked Ray, 
and he has spoken about the criminal expungement previously, but I would really like to get into details. And so Ray at this time is going to um, provide us with a discussion, lead us on a discussion of what is criminal expungement and how it could possibly relate to the state bar. Yes, thank, thank you, Justin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really glad to see you folks on here and hopefully contribute to a robust discussion on this issue because I think it's absolutely essential. Um, so uh, I think what we should be talking about um, are really uh, four things, which is basically what, when, where, and why when it comes to an expungement. Um, so the what is basically what is the effect of it when it comes to attorneys? And so, um, so why, would, why would people want an expungement? I, I think it boils down to number one, they don't want that information published. So depublished somehow or um, removed or somehow not being um, disclosed on a website or any other uh, platform, I think is, is really the reason why people want an expungement. And then the second thing when it comes to what, meaning what the effect of an expungement is, is the ability to deny that you were disciplined. That is a huge factor, at least in the criminal world. When people get an expungement, they want to be able to deny that question on a form that says, have you ever been convicted? And by you being able to say no, that gives the expungement that full weight of of being able to have a clear record and being able to be confident in knowing that uh, you could say and you could deny it. So that's, uh, I think a crucial step is, what are we going to say has the effect of an expungement? And then secondly, when I, when I talk about when, so when should we apply, or when, when should we allow the process to develop and apply for an expungement. Now, typically in a criminal case, uh, the person is put on probation. And um, during that time of probation, they have to comply with certain things like counseling or doing treatment or paying restitution or whatever. Now, at the end of the probationary period, usually two years, they can then apply to get that case expunged. Uh, there is a process in the criminal context of terminating your probation earlier. And so by terminating it earlier than, for example, the two years, you're able to apply for an expungement much sooner. Some of the reasons why a judge would terminate it earlier is, for example, if the conviction um, has resulted in um, a detriment to their ability to advance in their professional life. It, it, it's a result in uh, loss of uh, opportunities for a job. Uh, maybe there's an immigration uh, consequence issue that uh, an expungement would help. Um, and, or maybe there's a job opportunity where um, they, they need to get it expunged before they can start a job. So, uh, so, so I think we should be talking about when we are going to allow uh, or, or suggest uh, an attorney be allowed to apply for an expungement. Is it during, do we have to wait till the disciplinary proceeding or sentence, if you will, is completed or can we allow for it to terminate earlier? So that's the when. And then the third is where. So I understand the process is that the state bar essentially uh, uh, decides uh, um, and has the protocols with respect to recommending uh, an expungement. And then ultimately it's uh, decided by the California Supreme Court. So I think, um, although that seems to be a system that works because of the way I understand it, the Supreme Court just rubber stamps essentially what the state bar recommends. So, um, I'm not sure if uh, that needs to be changed, uh, but maybe an idea is that um, could it be expedited? It, could it be faster if the decision-making is made 
by the state bar and the, no need to have to um, wait for the process to somehow go to the Supreme Court for final approval. So I, I, I think that process should be looked at. And then the fourth one, which is a little bit uh, harder, is why, uh, meaning um, what cases uh, and how are, are those cases decided? And I, I talked about this earlier about mandatory versus discretionary. So in the criminal world, um, there are cases when it's mandatory that you have a right to get your case expunged. And there's discretionary, which are those cases where you have to sort of prove that it's in the interest of justice that your case be expunged. So that's gonna require, I think, some data because I think we're gonna need uh, to know uh, the series of violations of discipline in, in, in their proper categories, uh, how, you know, how many there are, um, what kinds there are and grouped together so we can maybe categorize those that um, maybe aren't very serious. And as, as, as the, um, the caller had, the public comment had alluded to, there are some that are just really meaningless. And um, maybe that's the kind of mandatory expungements that should be done. And then of course, there are the more egregious um, conduct, which I think the, a, a discretionary more level of review um, is needed. Um, and, and so uh, that, that's where I think we should be discussing what, when, where, and why, and hopefully we can lead to um, uh, uh, some kind of recommendation. Um, and then I, I will say one thing, when, when Justin just put up this the slide about um, the expungements with respect to failure to pay fees, I actually think that that kind of expungement uh, should be, just by way of example, that should be mandatory. But, you know, it, it brought to me the, 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 the thought that that kind of violation, I don't even think should be a disciplinary, uh, disciplinary action should be taken just because someone can't pay their fees. Um, I, obviously, we don't have a a, a debtor's court in criminal law when you can't pay restitution. Uh, but so I, I don't think it should be a discipline thing to, ha to have someone who can't pay their fees go on their record. I think that's, that's not right. Um, and so that's the kind of, uh, I, I don't know, discussions that we need to be having uh, about how do we open up the world of expungement to the attorney discipline system. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And I, I will clarify that those are administrative. So they're not, that is, suspension is not discipline, but it is administrative um, suspension. So we have a couple hands up. Um, Michelle, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, in, in regards to um, the expungement process, um, it, I'm, I'm looking, from it as a criminal prosecutor. And um, so I don't know what we're particularly doing in comparison because we've had AB 1950, um, which basically took all misdemeanors and pretty much said the probationary period shall be one year. So um, in regards, I don't know how that has impacted the expungement pro process, since normally we wait for the probationary period to end. And then I would also comment that the other thing that we do is that when people are seeking to terminate early, they have to notify the prosecution and the prosecution does have a um, right to respond and to request denial of the termination of process. So I think that we need to look at um, those models um, in order to come up with how we expunge in this context for the disciplinary system. Thank you. I'm Steve. Thanks. Uh, I raised my hand initially to 
make the point that that Justin made, but I, I guess I'll reinforce it here that 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 failure to pay is an administrative suspension and is not disciplinary. It's not something that the Office of Chief Trial Counsel uh, gets involved with uh, at all. So uh, it's not considered disciplinary proceeding or disciplinary suspension. Uh, that doesn't necessarily invalidate or, or change uh, Ray's point about, you know, what should happen as a result of it, but it's definitely not something that is part of the discipline system. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to mention is that I, I'm not sure that there is, you know, there, there was discussion of the Supreme Court rubber stamping the state bar court in recommendations on expungement. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's the correct characterization. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to point that out. The, what the state bar court does is, it, it, what the state bar does is expunge records as directed by the California Supreme Court by statute in Business and Professions Code 6092.5. And so uh, it's really the action from the Supreme Court that dictates what happens. Uh, and uh, I haven't seen a lot of these occur, but my understanding is that the request actually is to the Supreme Court not through uh, state bar court, et cetera. I could be wrong about that, however. Yeah. The, Go ahead, Steve, sorry. The last point I wanted to make, Justin, so if, is on a different topic. So if you wanted to correct my misunderstanding of, of that process, go ahead. No, I, that, that's, um, <laughs> that's the next slide I had was on expungement and you cited the business and professions codes exactly. Um, then I can share the screen one. Second, and then I'll go back to you. Um, okay. Uh, if the technology will work. Can we see the screen? On expungement, can everybody see the screen? I can't tell. Yes, um, we can see. So, um, this was, uh, there was a memo that OGC that will be referenced later that talked about this and what could be expunged from the website. And the current process for expungement, it says that we will do what is expunged by the state bar or the uh, California Supreme Court. And when this memo was done in 2016, there was two petitions for expungement and they were both denied. And so it is not something that is frequently done there are no rules promulgated around you know, this process. You can petition the Supreme Court, but this isn't something where there are rules where it has to be after a certain amount of time or certain offenses or anything like that. So that might be an area where this subcommittee wants to look deeper. And, and do they think that that's an area where they should promulgate rules, either the Supreme Court um, on kind of a process to expunge and, and get the expectations of what types of offenses could potentially be expunged or not expunged. But right now there is a process, it's almost never used. And it's it, from what we could tell back then, and I don't have any current information if anything happened between 2016 and now, but um, it's not likely to result in actual uh, expungement currently. Well, is it is it almost never, what was the reason why it's almost never used? Do, do, do people, like think it's a sort of a high standard to meet, or is it just not known that you can do that? And then my second question is, um, what will it take to change a rule of court? Well, I mean, we can, we can propose, you know, modifications to the rule of court. I mean, there's not, um, that's something that we do in terms of, at our agenda setting and setting out for public comment and then having the board of trustees, um, you know, adopt changes to the rules of court. So it's something that can be done. Um, if, in response to the first question, I don't know, I can get you the answer, but unfortunately we don't have the ADDC representation on this working group. So I'm sure Ellen or Ed would be better able to tell you why it's not more widely used or why they don't considered a viable alternative or viable avenue to pursue. So, so if I can finish my last point, which is kind of related to what Ray just asked, you know, it may be helpful. 
Uh, and that is just that there is a statute that requires that all uh, post notice of disciplinary charges uh, filings be public and therefore that discipline be public. And that is Business and Professional Code 6086.1. Uh, and it, it says that it shall be, shall be public, uh, which necessarily, I think, includes those records of, of discipline. Now, that doesn't mean that that statute can't be changed, but that may be one reason why uh, the court, for example, is looking at it and saying that, that they're looking at it more in terms of a, um, you know, a pardon, if you will, which is much harder to achieve than a 1203.4 type of uh, resolution. And so maybe that's what the committee wants to look to and you know, say, okay, what is, is there a, an intermediate type of resolution uh, that we could look for or something, or do we need to approach you know, the legislature about changing the statute, et cetera? Uh, Michelle. Well, my question is, um, Justin, first of all, is there a list of, um, do we have like a list of disciplinary actions that the state bar takes in the normal period of probation or uh, time period that the discipline is enforced? And then um, with uh, regard to Steve's re uh, comments, um, is there a period of time that it is required to be posted on the website? So we're, we'll have a conversation um, on the website, but I will answer your question now. So the once the discipline has been adjudicated, it goes on the website and does not come off. So it is on the website for ever. Um, now, so if you have a, you know, suspension, stayed, probation, it is on the website. There is a little bit of a difference. There are certain things, and we'll go on to, we'll talk about the consumer alerts later, where there are consumer alerts that go on the website for a certain amount of time. And then once the issue has been resolved, you know, the final discipline or something, those consumer alerts will come off the website, but the discipline will remain. So um, the discipline stays on the website now um, currently forever. And that's one of the areas where I think this working group will really want to look at, are there certain types of discipline that may come off the website or, and it, whether or not, as Ray was saying, is that an automatic or is it something that needs to be petitioned and evaluated and what levels um, of discipline would qualify for that? And, and that's where I think that if that's an area where this working group wants to dive into, there may be some research where we bring back to the committee the diff various different levels of discipline and examples and, and kind of also in that <laughs> the future slides, um, there was a survey of other states and how long they have their discipline on their website and whether or not it comes off after a certain amount of time or if it's even on the website that I think um, this working group will likely have us want to update and get more current um, because it is a couple of years old. Um, and in order to make the decision, you know, finalize recommendations. But this is a very good discussion to start. Um, Sarah. Um, I was just going to say, you know, it's clear that there are both substantive considerations here about what the rule should be and then procedural considerations about what changes maybe need to be made to the statutory framework to effectuate them. Um, and maybe it makes sense to talk about what we think the rule should be first and then try to deal with procedurally, how do we kind of get there? Because um, talking about the two in tandem, I, I think is difficult. Um, so that was just one suggestion. And then two, um, you know, obviously the backdrop to this discussion um, is um, the analysis and report that was prepared about the gross racial disparities in the disciplinary system. And we need to keep in mind that we're looking for a rule that, that's fair, but also a rule that will remediate um, uh, the effect of some of those disparities in the past. Um, and so I think 
we just need to keep that in mind as we kind of move forward. Nobody alluded to that directly, but just wanted to kind of center the discussion around that as well, because I think from the purpose of remediation, um, we might come to some different conclusions, you know, in light of that report than we would have in the absence of it in terms of expungement. Um, so that was it for me, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's one more slide that um, I wanted to talk about with in, in terms of expungement and it's just um, the sealing of discipline records. There's a pretty high standard set for the sealing of discipline records. And so um, I wanted to bring that um, to the working group that judges can seal records on very um, narrow, or, or I don't wanna speak for them, but I'm under these circumstances that you can read right there, but it has to, the interest of sealing them has to outweigh the public interest in the proceeding. And that is the balance that this working group is trying to strike is the state bar's number one, um, what we're supposed to do is protect the public. It's our number one charge. And yet we're also trying to um, address those racial disparities that the Farkas report brought out. And so we're trying to do that balance. And um, so I don't know, because Ray, you have your hand up. Um, yes. Um, let me ask you a question about the, 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 the sealing of records. What effect, if any, um, does a person have, if they filed a Freedom of Information Act request about an attorney's disciplinary records. What's the... yeah? I mean, if if I were to send you a letter and I would cite the Freedom of Information Act on a particular attorney and want their records, would I be able to get it through that vehicle? I can answer that. We we handle those in uh, in my shop, and uh, yeah, it's under the California Public Records Act is the um, is the law that we're bound by, and. Um, we produce what are called discipline histories. And so we have a, a database that we can extract data from. Um, we don't get it on individual attorneys. That's, uh, or I, don't, I haven't seen requests on individual attorneys. It's a, it's a sort of mass um, data query where we go in and we, we pull the information that we have for attorneys who have been uh, suspended, disbarred, or subject to any other form of public discipline. Whoa add to that uh, and because we do get some requests under the California Public Records Act uh, statute uh, regarding individual attorneys. And we, uh, our records pre-notice of disciplinary charges filing in state bar court are exempt uh, under several of the exceptions uh, for under the CPRA. Uh, so we would provide responsive documents uh, that are not confidential, but those records that are confidential, meaning those that, that either did not result uh, in a notice of disciplinary charges being filed, or those that have not yet resulted in a notice of disciplinary charges being filed would not be produced as a result of that request. All right, thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that, if, if the records, somehow you won the motion to have your records sealed, would those be given through the PRA? Uh, I'm sorry, say I, what, uh, what types of records? If, the if ones that are sealed. sealed. If they were sealed, they would not be given. Okay, just make it sure. Okay, so that's kind of the discussion on expungement um, that we wanna have. I see that it kind of leads into what's on the website because we already jumped ahead and asked some questions as to what's on the website. And so I think it might be most useful if I give the presentation on what's currently on the website and then we have a discussion at the end on expungement and on the website because I think they're very much overlapping. Um, so with that, I will start to share my screen again. All right, 
Hopefully you can see it. And Mr. Winfield, is your hand up from before or did you want to? Okay. Um, Sorry, here it goes. But, well, it actually was, but it, a question just came up when I was thinking. Sure. Just like you had the, the kind of the brief statistics on the expungement, do you, do you have a, a number on the, the filings for sealing and if they were granted? I don't, but I can bring that back to a future meeting. Um, okay. I don't off the top of my head, but I, I will bring that back. Okay. Then. Okay. Um, so this is, I think Steve might've mentioned this because he's quoting all my business and professions code before I get to the slides. Um, this talks about how the state bar shall respond within a reasonable time for inquiries as to the public discipline that has been posed upon an attorney in California. And this is part of the Office of General Counsel memo that we circulated at a previous, I think the June 22nd, um, meeting of the Fairness Subcommittee, and it was in response to, a, I think it was two complaints from attorneys, one who was disbarred and was no longer an attorney and was in real estate, and so he had a real estate license, and when he wanted to get his discipline removed from the website because it was, you know, 15 years ago and he was no longer an attorney, and so he wanted his disbarment off the website, and then another one uh, wanted their discipline um, removed. And so the Office of General Counsel looked at all the business and professions codes and the rules to see what the bar is required to do for this. And so we are required to provide the public with um, the disciplinary record. And the easiest and most efficient way to do that is on the website, but we do it by telephone or if people come in, we can do it in written form too. But also from that memo, these are two key things, or one key thing that I want to bring up is that we're not specifically required by statute to post public discipline on the website. And although it tends to promote transparency and facilitates the public's right to access the records, we are, there is no statute that would need to be changed if there was a decision to modify the length of time that the discipline is on the website. And so I wanted to make that clear, we're, provide, we're required to disclose it, and we're required to disclose it for the length um, of the bar right now, but there's no mandate that we have to disclose it on the website. So we previously, at a previous subcommittee, talked about consumer alerts. And so I wanted to go over the specific areas where consumer alerts are um, warranted and displayed on the attorney profile page. And again, this is only on the attorney profile page. If there are certain um, filings, and the first one is felony charges pending in superior court. So if someone has felony charges, um, when the state bar learns of this, there is a consumer alert that goes up on the attorney's website uh, profile page. And that alert stays up on that profile page until the state bar receives notices that the charges have been dismissed, or if they've been reduced from like a felony to a misdemeanor, or the filing of a decision or order in state bar court adjudicating the disciplinary proceeding that would accompany these charges. So that is one reason why that the consumer alert would go up on an attorney's um, profile page. Another one is if a superior court assumes jurisdiction um, over law practices. So when the state bar is notified of this, a consumer alert will go up on the website. And all of these consumer alerts are on the website until certain things, until there's resolution in the matter. Either the matter is adjudicated or it's withdrawn, um, but it will stay on the website as long as the process is continuing. And so this one, um, uh, once the superior court order is rescinded or terminated, then it would come off the website. Um, there's in voluntary and active enrollment, suspension, disbarments, and resignation with charges pending. So um, this consumer alert will go up on the website. Um, there is a bunch of business and professions codes that we um, that OCTC can place an attorney on inactive enrollment. Um, and this remains up on the attorney's website um, until either the attorney is reinstated to practice law or you know, the, the attorney passes or some other disbarment, um, uh, then it was removed. Um, 
The next one is a substantial threat of harm proceedings. So this is a specific petition that OCTC files because um, the feel the respondent should be placed on inactive status because he or she poses a substantial threat of harm to the public or clients. Um, and so this is a, a consumer alert that goes on the web page until the harm petition has been dismissed um, and OCTC has decided not to appeal that dismissal or a decision or order from state bar court adjudicating on this uh, substantial threat of harm proceeding. Um, another consumer alert is to do with the notice of disciplinary charges. Um, upon the filing of notice of disciplinary charges, that is on the attorney's profile page. And then it comes off once the charges are either dismissed or there's a decision in the proceedings. Um, and then Finally, if there is probation or unsatisfied conditions of a public approval, um, this is a consumer alert that goes on the profile page. And once the probation period is over or certain conditions have been met, this comes off um, the attorney's uh, page. And so those are different than the discipline. Anytime there's discipline, that stays. But these consumer alerts are what goes that red box that goes at the top of the attorney profile. And they are only on there while those proceedings are going on. Ray, I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you, uh, Justin. Uh, so I have a couple of questions and I'll just throw it out there uh, for you all to uh, maybe answer and discuss. Um, so when it comes to the consumer alerts, uh, who, who where do you get where what is the authority for these categories as being the uh, the necessary to have a consumer alert? Was it the bar who formulated these categories or is it by statute? I, I'm just sort of interested in how it, this was arrived at and whether or not it can be modified. Secondly, um, the uh, I have a question when it comes to uh, as the first category said felony, uh, charges pending. Um, when an attorney, and this is my question, if an attorney has criminal charges pending, it, be it a felony or a misdemeanor, does that uh, result in disciplinary proceedings being initiated or investigated? Um, or does that uh, really not happen until and unless the person was convicted? Um, and then the other issue I had is, I'm not sure it's fair to uh, say that someone has felony charges pending just because it's pending. Um, I think it's, it's more relevant if the charges were of a conviction rather than uh, pending. I mean, you can get a felony vandalism pending and you know the way the cases are now, I mean, it, it, it could take a while because of, you know, uh, the courts, congestion, COVID, and all that. And so I'm not sure it's uh, right that we can have pending charges be a consumer alert. I think it's just more teeth, more teeth to it if it's actually resulted in a conviction. Those are my questions. Thanks. I'm going to defer. Steve has his hand up, but I was going to call on him anyway. Um, Steve, you're the expert in this area. So please. Uh, Thanks, Justin. Uh, so yes, to answer your first question, uh, the source of the consumer alerts is uh, state bar board policy. Uh, and yes, it can be changed. Uh, the, I, it, the focus of your second question is based on the felony alert. Uh, and so let me outline a little bit about what is required of the state bar and how we arrived at that policy. Uh, and hopefully that answers your second question. But uh, there is, uh, there are several statutes that provide for the state bar to be informed of charges pending against a lawyer. Uh, prosecutors are required by law to disclose to the state bar the pendency of an action against an attorney that charges either a felony or a misdemeanor. And that's Business and Professions Code 6101 per NB. Uh, attorneys are also required to notify the state bar 
of the filing of an information or an indictment charging the attorney with a felony. Uh, and that's under 6068 paren O paren four. Uh, there is also an obligation that courts have to uh, provide, to, to disclose to the state bar upon conviction of an attorney. But there are two uh, methods by which either prosecutors or, uh, uh, or the attorney themselves are, are required to report to the state bar the pendency of felony charges. So uh, the state bar is required by law to disclose to any member of the public who inquires any information that is reasonably available to the state bar pursuant to 60680 and 6101. Those are the two statutes that require the reporting from the prosecutors and from the, from the attorney themselves. And that is Business and Professions Code section 6086.1 paren C, which says specifically the state bar has to, to provide that information. Um, so that's the basis for that felony uh, you know, alert. Uh, in essence, um, that's a situation where if somebody would call us and say, hey, is anything pending against this person, we would tell them. But what the, the concern was is that because we we're posting all this information on the, on the attorney profile page, that people would look at the profile page, not see anything, and then not bother calling uh, to find out that information, which is why that information was then posted, uh, why the board adopted that policy for posting. Um, so hopefully that answers the question about the concern. There was a, another sort of specific question about the timing of the conviction case. Uh, and we do open a case upon um, learning either through uh, the court after conviction, through the attorney themselves at the filing of the information or indictment, or from the prosecutor, or frankly, uh, through, you know, if we learn about it through uh, the newspaper or something by some other means, uh, we will open what we would call a C, a conviction C case uh, in tracking. And we would just check in with the court periodically to make sure that the case hadn't been dismissed or whatever. Uh, and it would only be transmitted to state bar court, however, after the conviction. So hopefully that answers your question. And Steve, that not all cases are that result in conviction are transmitted to state bar court, correct? That is correct. They, they it is only if it's conduct that uh, is moral turpitude or other conduct warranting discipline. So there are some, uh, you know, they're mostly misdemeanors, but generally there are some convictions that are not deemed to necessarily be conduct warranting discipline. Okay. Um, looks like Miss Joseph has her hand up. Yes, I have a few questions. One is when you're saying that these, um, the petition for expungements have to go to the California Supreme Court when you send those, are you sending them with a recommendation to either uh, grant it, grant the expungement or not? That's my first question. And then second, my second and third questions have to do with what Ray just asked. Um, so when you say that it's board policy to have the consumer alert when there is an action pending and you said that could be changed. I wonder if you could speak to how that could be changed. And number two, I just wanna be clear that I'm understanding that um, the, that the reason that we have it on the website as the consumer alert is more for uh, being proactive in the sense that it, you feel that if it's not on, if a pending felony, action is not on the website, then someone may not inquire as to any discipline to that individual. And secondarily, just because it is required um, that the prosecution inform you 
of a pending fel felony conviction and or the attorney has to inform you doesn't mean that it has to be put on the website as a consumer alert. Is that, am I under, I just wanna be sure I'm understanding. So the, the first question uh, was sort of back to the expungement issue. Uh, and I think I'll let Justin answer because I, I don't have much experience in that regard. I, I don't think that, uh, but again, I'll let Justin correct me, but I don't think that they go to certainly the Office of Chief Trial Counsel or to the State Bar Court for a recommendation before they go to the Supreme Court for determination as to expungement. Justin? Right. And there's those rare instances, it is the respondent that is petitioning the uh, Supreme Court themselves directly. So it wouldn't be, we wouldn't have any input on that. To ask your second and third questions, uh, yes, you, you heard me correctly that it was board policy. It can be changed. The process that it would be changed is through a, an agenda item at a board, at a, some board meeting in the future to change that board policy. Um, and the, as to your third question, which I believe was about whether it's required to be posted on the website, there is nothing, as, as Justin said, that requires uh, any of this information to be posted on the website. I think that you're correct uh, that the concern was that if it were not posted on the website, because the, the state bar has been working towards, uh, you know, transparency and completely posting records that are that should be open to the public on the attorney profile page um, that if information isn't included there that somebody may go navigate to the website to look at some at the attorney profile page and then may make the determination that they don't need to call because you know they look at one person and they have this lengthy history and this other person has nothing on there and they may say, okay, why would I call? Clearly there's nothing there. Uh, now that doesn't mean it, that this committee couldn't say, we'll make a recommendation. Okay, well, we recommend that something not be posted on the website, but instead have a disclaimer. This may not include all information. If you're interested, please call or you know something along those lines, but uh, hopefully that answers your question. Mr. Or did you have a follow up? I did. Thank you. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is whether we have numbers of, I guess my concern is the same as Mr. Bueno and Torres, which is we're putting um, information about pending felony charges before someone has been convicted. And so do we have numbers of how many postings we've had of that nature, which result in people not being convicted, because then I feel like, and then the racial component to that, because I feel like we are marring people's reputation with having them be subjected to information on the website. If one, the case gets dismissed or two, uh, they're found not guilty or, I mean, there's a number of circumstances having practiced criminal law for a long time where those um, those allegations, pending allegations, may not actually result in guilty convictions. And so I'm concerned about what that's doing to the reputation of the attorney, um, if that's the case. Yeah, uh, of course. I, I mean, I think that I also practiced criminal law for a long time, and I, I agree that, that there certainly are occasions where that happens. Uh, I think that we have had one, maybe two, uh, situations where uh, the the a consumer alert was removed once the case was dismissed or reduced to a misdemeanor, um, but we haven't had many. However, in, in in the interest of full disclosure, I would say that that possibly the number is only one or two because we really haven't posted very many of these felony alerts in the first place. Um, you know, it was relatively recently that we started posting these alerts, uh, and it still does not uh, apply to all of the felonies that are pending uh, currently. This is something that we have been sort of slowly going back and adding where appropriate. Um, you know, 
I will point out or reiterate that that we are required by statute to disclose the information. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to post it on the website, but but the legislature uh, has deemed that the public interest in having information about pending felonies uh, is such in the public interest that it should be made available to them. Now, again, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be posted proactively on the website, uh, but there, it, the, they did not limit it to conviction. And Steve, what, did this go in, I know the agenda item that I read on this was 2018. Is that when this started or did it start before that? There, that's when the policy was passed. However, that's not when we when uh, the state bar started posting those. No, because we had okay. state bar had to develop a process, uh, technological process, to post and remove those alerts. And of course, uh, one of the primary concerns, as as you all have put your thumb on, uh, is leaving an alert up uh, when it should no longer be up. Uh, and of course, there's also the concern of having it up, you know, when they haven't been convicted in the first place. But as I said, we determined based on the statutory instruction that that was our, our task, uh, was to post that information. Um, but uh, we certainly didn't want to leave it up when, after we'd been notified that the case had been dismissed or reduced to a misdemeanor, et cetera. And so we had to build that te technological piece. Uh, and that's why it's only been relatively recently that we've started posting those consumer alerts. Uh, I don't have a, a number of alerts that we have posted. I could probably get that number uh, for a future meeting. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give a time context on that. Mr. Winfield, you've been patient with your hand up. Oh, um, yeah, well, I was kind of going on what Ms. Joseph was saying, but Stephen kind of said what I was thinking. Why couldn't there just be a disclaimer on the site that basically says that this is not the complete information. If you want more information on a particular individual, you can call this number. Um, and I think that's probably a disclaimer for stuff that we're going to, or convictions that we're going to look at that we say aren't being posted, but are still kept on the attorney's record. Therefore, you would still have that disclaimer on the site saying that you can call. Um, that was all I had on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will share the slide again. And the technology catches up. Um, so at, as a reminder, because we're going to start talking about, you know, what is on the website and potentially what could come off the website, I just wanted to do a quick reminder that there are several non-disciplinary outcomes um, that we, when the State Bar receives a complaint, and some of them are you know, closure, not insufficient evidence, there's resource letters, there's directional letters, um, there's agreement in lieu of discipline, there's referrals um, to the lawyer assistance program, and there's warning letters. Um, the disciplinary outcomes are a private approval, and that is on the website in certain circumstances, and that I will go in detail in the next slide. There's also the public approval stays on the website, probation with state suspension, probation with actual suspension and disbarment. And all of these things stay on the website forever currently. Um, the difference of private approval before the notice of disciplinary charges, this is where it is truly private. So it is not on the website. The notice of disciplinary charges have not been filed. And so this is something that if a consumer goes on the attorney profile page, they will not see anything about this private approval. Private approval after the notice of disciplinary charges, this is on the website. So 
the charge, there were notice of disciplinary charges, but after all the facts and everything came out, the level of discipline that was agreed upon was a private approval. But since the notice of disciplinary charges has already been um, posted to the website, even though it's a private approval, this is on the website and continues to stay on the website. Um, a public approval obviously is on the website and um, stays on the website for the life of the website. So other states in the 2016 um, memo from the Office of General Counsel, and so this data is old, I'm assuming that the working group would like us to update this and bring it forward, but it does show what states have the records of discipline online and how far back it goes. Some of them go back a couple of years, some of them go back to the life of the bar, much like us. There are a couple of states at the time, it was just, I believe, Florida and Texas that had a certain, certain statutory or a certain year requirement. So ten, after 10 years, the discipline would drop off from the website. And at this time, granted, this was five years ago, there was certain states that didn't have anything on their website because they weren't technologically advanced. I imagine that that is a lot less now. Um, but uh, this is an area where we can bring back at a future working group meeting and update this chart with the information from other states to see if there are any other states besides Texas and Florida that have things drop off after a certain number of years. And if there are still states that don't have anything online. Um, and if there's anything else out there that we haven't been thinking about in our discussion. So that is our presentation for now. I wanted to get through the what was on the website, and then we also talked about expungement. So now um, I have a couple of requests for data that I've noted, but I would like to have kind of a discussion from the working group members on areas. Let's we can start with expungement. Um, are there areas other than what I've been taking notes, but other than what has been previously said? that we want to look at in terms of expungement? Um, are, are we looking at maybe trying to develop rules for what would constitute an expungement? Because right now there is an expungement process. You can petition the Supreme Court. It, the respondent can petition the Supreme Court for expungement. It's seldom used. And I apologize for not um, having someone from ADDC let us know why it's seldom used. But it, um, I can bring that information back. But I kind of want to ask the working group um, what their thoughts are with, as it relates to expungement. Ms. Good. Thanks, Justin. Um, I, uh, I thought that we were going to have a discussion, um, you know, and hopefully the state bar staff would kind of guide it because you are in the best position to do that. These are the um, looking at discipline and sort of figuring out what are the um, most um, egregious kind of violations um, down to the most minimal so that we could maybe make rules about what should be expunged and what in what time period they should be expunged. And then maybe there's a category of discipline, as Ray alluded to in one of his prior um, presentations, that isn't expunged or that has uh, more of a, you know, sort of pardon process, if you will, um, in place for that, kind of akin to what we have in the, in the criminal realm. You know, some felonies aren't expungible. You've got to go to the governor to do it. Um, so I think it would be useful to see what the range is so that we could then categorize things and kind of make judgments about each category. So, thanks. Okay, thank you. That, that makes sense. Um, Steve and I had kind of a, a conversation before the meeting started about, you know, what constitutes a public approval versus what constitutes a private approval and it's a lot of it is the specifics of the case. So it's not all this thing equals X or that thing equals Y, because there's a lot of mitigation. You know, you have to take in the mitigating factors or the aggravating factors. So it could be the same offense, but there's 
prior discipline or it's there's something that you know makes it worse than <laughs> that same type of case but i think that in general we can try and bring back um the level of discipline um to the committee where they can kind of determine especially at the lower end um what they would like to see potentially come off the website and um you know the number we can look at the other states to try and give us kind of a gauge on the number of years that it should um, stay on the website because that's something that, you know, <laughs> pulling it from the website is half the battle. Deciding when to pull it from the website is the other half. And to get that balance between public protection where it's recent enough that it would be impactful for someone making that, the consumer making a decision on whether or not to hire an attorney, but also not punitive that it's on there 20 years a relatively minor offense and may cost, you know, it may not be relevant to anything in the, the attorney's practice today. So I think we can bring the, both of those things back um, to the committee to help drill down and make that decision. Mr. Moab. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that internally in the committee that we're all talking about the same thing when we're talking about this expungement, et cetera. Obviously, Ray is well acquainted with, with 1203.4. And, and so, um, you know, it's a, I agree that a big portion of the value of 1203.4 is being able to answer no to that question of you know, have you been convicted on a job application, et cetera. And, I, and in my mind, I don't know that this is correct, sort of the parallel to that is somebody who is looking to hire a lawyer coming to the State Bar website to see what prior discipline has been imposed. So if that isn't listed there, that's one thing. If they call and, and then, you know, what answer does the State Bar give? That's another th question. Do, would they if we have a 1203.4 equivalent, would that, uh, would the state bar not post it on the website, but still say, yes, it happened if somebody calls. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the next thing is, would that 1203.4 uh, attorney discipline case still be uh, a prior record of discipline to be, that could be used uh, in an appropriate case where there is future discipline or a future disciplinary case uh, that is potentially an aggravating factor. And so I think we need to be clear about what it is that we're trying to figure out here. And, and if the answer is all three of them, then that's the answer. If the answer is just one and not two, you know, that's the other answer or, or whatever. Ray. Yes, thank you. I. I... I, I want to thank Stephen for your your comment. I, I think it, you you hit it on the nail, and I and I agree. It's all of all three of them, um, but um, so maybe I could just try to take a stab at some of the things you said. So, I think the issue of the ability to say you have no disciplinary record um, when it comes to something that's been expunged, um, it is what is so powerful about an expungement. And I think the bar's answer could be, let's just take an, a typical example. A, a person was uh, convicted, if you will, of whatever disciplinary proceeding, and then that's expunged. Well, then the answer should be, I have no record of discipline on this attorney um, because it was expunged. So you don't need to go any, anything further than that. Um, and then I, I, I think that, um, uh, the, the issue of what is considered public, and I, I know you've all talked about what's required um, and what's not required, and the definition of public um, uh, disclosure somewhat, I think we need to uh, figure out uh, really what is, what we have a good understanding of what exactly is needed when we say it has to be public. And then all the, the slide that talked about all the levels of disciplinary, whether it's private or public, um, 
that I think all should be removed if expungement is granted. And then the other uh, interest that I have, and I would uh, hopefully the, the um, staff can bring this back, is I'm very interested in the process of expungement when it comes to the Supreme Court. I would, for example, in the few cases that they have occurred, I'd like to know what were the steps, um, how long it took, whether or not um, uh, uh, there was some assistance by the bar, uh, what are the costs uh, to file a petition like that uh, to the Supreme Court, and what, how much input does the applicant have? Is it a an actual hearing or is it just a review? Um, so, because I, again, I, I always I, when I heard about that, that's the way it's done. I think that shouldn't be the way it's done. And I, and I think it should be brought back to the bar uh, because I think that's where all the action happens, all the information is there and the attorney can provide more input uh, and have more of a meaningful discussion about whether or not the expungement should be granted rather than some distant court um, who is just basically reviewing materials uh, and maybe not even having a full blown hearing. So that's my thought, thank you. Right. Um, I think that is useful to, to clarify because we are, these issues overlap, but we need to be specific about them. So the, the expungement request, I, I have um, in my notes that I, I need to bring back more information on the specifics of the expungement request that is the petition to um, the Supreme Court. And I can bring that back. But then there's also the, the, issue with disclosure along with that, and then also what's publicly available, which is a separate issue um, that we've kind of talked about. Um, someone brought to my attention, Steve, um, currently we implemented a priority system for complaints. And so we have higher priority um, complaints. We, we work those more aggressively or quicker. And then the lower priority complaints, um, you know, we prioritize. Would that be a useful measure in terms of looking at things that could potentially come off the website in terms of value, you know, if we're trying to look at things um, that could come off the website, if they were a low priority complaint, would that potentially be something that could be removed from the website? Uh, it's certainly something that we could look at. I don't know uh, that all of the things that that somebody as a member of the public would be would place a lot of emphasis on in being interested in knowing about is represented in the priority one criteria uh the priority one criteria was developed to be about you know five to ten percent of, of our caseload and it is more than that it's probably about 16 percent right now uh, but it's, it, it doesn't necessarily represent everything. For example, um, there are uh, certain types of misappropriations are included in the priority one criteria and others are not. Uh, it may be, for example, that somebody in the public, if, if an attorney ends up with client money, uh, then, you know, they'd want to know that. Uh, and so I don't know that that's the, the, the perfect bright line, uh, but maybe there's something that we could uh, change about that or tweak about that to develop that into something. And I just, I think I talked about a turn that assuming that everybody knows what the priority system is, um, can you just briefly mention what the priority system is or for the- Sure. Um, for- 20 plus years uh, until recently, the state bar had not received any fee increase, uh, which meant that we did not have any additional resources to deal with uh, complaints. Uh, in addition to that, there have been several occasions in the last uh, 20 years where uh, the state bar has actually closed down uh, for a period of time. And of course, the attorney complaints didn't stop or slow down um, they kept coming in. And so when the bar restaffed, uh, the bar had to deal with that crush of complaints that had come in during the time that the bar was shut down 
we're running on a skeleton crew. Uh, I mean, this is more of a long-term history. Uh, but uh, so there were a number of occasions there was concern about the backlog uh, statute and the number of cases in backlog. And that was really deemed to be the, really the only measure of success or health of the discipline system was how many cases there were in backlog. Uh, and what that created at the state bar was a culture where people would go and grab the oldest case off the wall, they would work it until it was done, and then they would move on to the next oldest case. And it did not represent uh, the cases that, that necessarily uh, were a threat where the attorney who was being complained about was a threat to the public, uh, or it, it didn't uh, encourage people to work cases that uh, that were potentially a threat to the public. And so we set about changing that while still understanding the statutory obligation to uh, try to move our cases, the goal uh, to try to move our cases within 180 days, uh, that within that, we would try to prioritize those cases that represented a threat to the public. And so uh, we've made a number of changes to try to streamline our processing of certain cases so that those that are um, misdemeanors are not treated the same way uh, that felonies are, and, and so to speak. Uh, you know, coming from a, a criminal practice, uh, you know, I saw that petty thefts were investigated much less rigorously than homicides, uh, and probably appropriately so. Uh, when I came to the state bar, uh, the level of detail and uh, effort that was put into a petty theft was the same as a homicide, so to speak, right? The, the attorney discipline case equivalent of those cases. Uh, the same process was followed, the same, et cetera. And it seemed to not make a whole lot of sense. It seemed like we could save resources on the petty thefts uh, and we could use those resources in the homicides. Uh, and so that was what the case prioritization system was about. And that's how it was developed. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Buenaventura. Yes, I, I forgot to mention, I wanted to comment on Steve's um, previous uh, comments about um, considering the person's record uh, when, when we're deciding upon an expungement. Uh, I did not want to forget to mention that, I, I mentioned this earlier and I wanted to hone in the point again, which is the idea of, you know, we, we have a progressive sentencing scheme uh, um, that we at least practice in criminal law. And obviously the idea being that if you are an offender that has a history of criminal conduct, you're supposed to be sentenced um, uh, that's supposed to be in consideration and you're, you're supposed to be uh, progressively sentenced in a, a more harsher way. And I don't think that should uh, uh, happen because if, if the reason why we are existing in this committee is to address the wrongs of the past, which, which could most uh, obviously, I'm sure happen, was the idea that people um, were perhaps unfairly uh, litigated, targeted, whatever you call it, that um, previous conduct, um, and if we agree that the system was uh, broken, if you will, with respect to black and, 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 and brown attorneys, that maybe we should not use that uh, against them, recognizing that the system failed them uh, earlier. And that's what we're here trying to do is to correct that and so that necessarily means, in my opinion, we shouldn't uh, count on, on their past criminal or past uh, bad activity when that inherently may have been something wrong and how that conviction happened in the first place. That was my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winfield. Okay. Um, when I, I agree, with, uh, Mr. Buenaventura, on that, and also in the criminal sense when there's a prior conviction or prior activity, after a certain amount of time, the DA doesn't even take that into consideration when adding on to the sentence. 
So if it happened 15, 20 years ago, the DA won't, won't even use it when they're when they're looking at the sentence, the DA or the judge. So after a certain amount of time, it becomes old and, and irrelevant. And if it has nothing to do with the, the current crime the person's being charged with. Um, also, I, I had a question for what Steve was talking about. Is there a policy or kind of a guidebook that lists what type of offenses are priority one, priority two, priority three, and so on? Uh, yeah, there there is, uh, in fact, attached to the uh, board agenda item, um, which was which approved the creation of the case prioritization system. There is a sample criteria, um, and I'm sure that uh, Justin could could pull that up. That I want to make sure that it's clear that we did not petition the board or request the board to adopt the criteria. They were simply sample criteria because the, uh, we did not want to go back to the board uh, every time we wanted to change the criteria or tweak them slightly. We wanted to be more nimble than that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that is attached to the board agenda item. Uh, I want to say that that was uh, uh, adopted in March of 2018. Um, and was on the board agenda for that meeting. Um, and so, yeah, the, we can definitely make that available to you. I will point out that while we did not want the board to, uh, to approve the criteria because we wanted to be more, more nimble, we have not changed the criteria either, uh, but that is a result at, at this point of, um, now we have put out a bunch of, numbers of this is how many p1 category cases we have this is how many uh, these other category cases we have and we didn't want somebody to uh perceive that we were changing those criteria in order to uh, gain some sort of benefit of of you know making it look like we were being more successful in reducing p1 cases for example um so we haven't changed it but that doesn't mean that we cannot or should not uh, as we gain more experience. As I mentioned, uh, the number of P1 cases are already significantly higher than we initially uh, hoped when we set up the case prioritization system. Okay. Now also with that, is, is there a guide or, or, or policy memo where there's like recommended uh, discipline for certain offenses as well? Not really. Uh, it's really a, a very complex analysis, and it involves uh, uh, the standards, which we go to first, uh, and then uh, and then case law, an assessment of case law, and trying to find uh, similar cases uh, and determining what uh, aggravating or mitigating circumstances apply, and then trying to find the appropriate uh, length of discipline for each individual case. So it be it's it becomes whoever it becomes whoever the the trial attorney is or whatever who puts together that in his head and spits out. No, not really. I mean, we've we've talked uh, at length in the com in the commission about uh, consistency and calibration, uh, and so there is a you know that the supervising attorney uh, signs off uh, on and agrees with. Uh, the level of discipline. It's really reached in sort of an, a, a discussion between the assigned attorney and the supervising attorney. Uh, it, it is proposed by the assigned attorney and then agreed to by the supervising attorney. And uh, those um, stipulations, to the extent that they are stipulations, uh, are reviewed by our training and calibration unit. Uh, and then as it was pointed out during the discussions, after the fact, uh, we go through and we say, okay, look, um, you know, this is probably too low uh, here type of thing. Uh, and, and that's a discussion among all of, this, of the supervising attorneys, the essays. Um, so they're aware of that. Uh, and we point to case law, hey, 
this is why this is probably a more appropriate range, whatever, but there's no policy directive or memo uh, that says that for a, um, you know, a petty theft, it's 10 days sheriff's work alternative. And, you know, for a grand theft, it's, you know, six months or something. There's nothing like that. Uh, but we, this, we do have the standards. Uh, the standards dictate generally what the range of the, of the discipline should be. Uh, and then to refine that, we go to case law. Okay. Hopefully, does that answer your question? Does that make sense? No, no, it, it, it answers my question. Um, but one more thing, one more thing. With, because I'm trying to get the process and, and how we get to the discipline. How, how many of those, how many of the disciplines end in stipulation as opposed to actually go on the full way to trial? The, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the numbers offhand, although I, Lisa Chavez, uh, the head of our ORIA, our, essentially our numbers and statistics uh, division is here. Uh, and I know that, that her unit can provide that information to you. I will say it's the vast majority of, of cases, just like in criminal, don't go to trial, right? I mean, it's you know something like 92% in, in criminal cases, 98, 90, 92 to 95 percent resolve prior to trial. Um, I don't think the percentages are the same, but it but the concept is the same. That most cases resolve short of trial in the okay. attorney discipline system too. All right. All right. Thanks. And Mr. Winfield, I will um, comment on the uh, prior discipline. I anticipate another working group being formed. Um, that prior discipline topic has been talked at the Fairness Committee. It's also been talked at the Effectiveness Subcommittee. And so I think we're going to take members from both of those committees and look at prior discipline and whether or not it should be you know, looked at in terms of the current discipline kind of concurrent events, if events, you know, aren't complained at the same time, but happen around the same time, and maybe some increased judicial discretion as to whether or not to consider um, prior discipline. That's um, something that I anticipate coming out of the next um, full ad hoc commission meeting that there'll be another working group just to look on that specific issue. Um, uh, Ms. Anderson. So is it possible for us to obtain a list of the charge disciplinary charges with the range of discipline? Um, is there something like that that exists so that we can look at that as a way of organizing what should be expunged in priorities? I think the best source of that is the standards, uh, which are posted uh, on the State Bar Court website, and I'm sure that Justin can get uh, for the members of this committee. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it certainly makes sense that now, as I said, some of those ranges are quite large. Some of them are, you know, suspension to disbarment, right, which could mean a stayed suspension. It could be an actual suspension of his, of generally 30 days is the shortest actual suspension that we have, um, going up to longer suspensions to disbarment. So that's quite a wide range. So it may not be super helpful. Um, but I, I certainly think that as we're looking at whether we're, whether we're considering a 1203.4 type of relief or whether we're considering a rehab and pardon type of relief, uh, it certainly would make sense that we would look to the the actual discipline imposed to determine you know what we're going to do with those it certainly makes sense that a reproval would be treated differently than a disbarment and you know i don't know where that line would be that would be up to this committee to to figure out uh but somewhere in there we'd start looking at those things differently and we could also be able to break that down by racial categories is that something that we'd be able to do. For instance, um, you know, if we have people that have to trust account violations. We know there may be some people that made the trust account violation by inadvertence or it's a low amount as opposed to somebody who is actively commingling or taking funds out 
And then you have discipline that could be, you know, you take a trust accounting class or you're disbarred or you're suspended. And so I'm wondering if there's a way that we can get information on that and also the racial breakdown so we can see if there's a disparity in, in um, treatment in regards to that type of discipline. And, and therefore we can look at it as a, a way of adjusting as far as expungement. So I, I would just, before throwing this out to Justin or Lisa or Dag or somebody to, to answer the question of whether whether we can get that dead data broken down by race, because uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I do just want to point out or reiterate that we don't discipline for inadvertence. We don't discipline even for negligence. Uh, we discipline for gross negligence and intentional conduct. But we don't uh, we don't discipline somebody for you know understandable negligence or you know they wrote a check on the wrong account and they went and fixed it or we don't discipline somebody for that, right? Um, so it, that's important to remember. Now, the larger question and the more important question that you had, I, I don't know that I can answer. I would defer, <laughs> Dagger, they say, can you, I'm not sure what the data is. I'm, I'm taking like really great notes on all the research requests and I'll, I will be getting back to you and see what's with a full answer on what's, what's available and what's not and et cetera. Okay. Um, I have, <laughs> I have numerous, um, data requests as well, a request for more information, not necessarily data requests. Um, I don't know if there's any more discuss discussion right now because I think I have my marching orders on what I need to bring back for the committee to make the decisions on where we're gonna go with expungement and where we're gonna go, what type of expungement, um, and we need to be clear on that. And then also potentially what, um, what we're going to do with the notice on the website um, on removal and length of time. Um, I think it might be helpful to share my listing that I've been trying to pull out um, so that if I'm missing anything egregious, it can be brought up. Um, and Ms. Good, you have your hand up. Yes, just a quick question. I was just wondering about next steps. I, you know, I'm mindful we have some deadlines in place and, you know, just wondered about timing and next steps so that we can, you know, actually get into the substance and make some recommendations about these things should be expunged, these things shouldn't, that kind of thing. Because um, I feel like we just, we just haven't gotten into the nitty gritty at all. Um, so, and I know it's a process, but, but it is a little frustrating. Um, I, I will need to um, go back and see how quickly we can turn this around. The idea is to, um, once I get a better sense of what's going to be required to get this information, you know, um, some of these requests I think are fairly simple. Some of them are not, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't, you know, if we can identify stuff and have another meeting, you know, in September, then I will put out, you'll see a doodle poll from me um, to get that. Because I agree that we do have a, a tighter timeline um, to get these recommendations formalized and then brought back to the full ad hoc commission um, to vote on to go to the board of trustees as final recommendations. Um, I, once I get a better sense of, of how long it will take us to gather all these things and so that, that the next meeting, this. First was kind of a level setting, kind of getting the idea and the trajectory of where the working group needs or wants to go. And now the next meeting we have, I will hopefully be able to present you with some materials before the meeting. And then at the meeting, we can kind of get into the details and hopefully come up with some recommendations. But it may take us two or three meetings because there, uh, there are some of these topics may need to be further 
defined, but I'm hoping within, you know, two meetings, three meetings tops, we would be able to come to recommendations. And I, um, let me add, if I may, Justin, this is Dag. So uh, on that list, you know, I think I've heard a couple of the members of this, this working group, subcommittee working group, both of, of the subcommittee on fairness of the ad hoc commission. I've heard a number of you ask about the the listing of what are the charges and how are they ranked? How do you, what's the hierarchy of severity of the charges? And, um, you know, as a researcher, I feel your pain in, in asking that question and not getting a satisfying answer because that is effectively how the criminal system is organized. And you can see clear rankings at the broad level from infraction through misdemeanor to felony and at more specific levels within each of those categories of specific types of cases that are, are more severe or less severe. And that just doesn't exist in the state bar court system, in the state bar is the discipline system. So I just wanted to, I, I think that that's gonna be, so if we're going to make progress on identifying like some thresholds, some cut points where we would say, you know, perhaps these might be eligible for some form of expungement, expungement under certain conditions. I, 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 I'm not sure how we get there with, without creating something that doesn't exist and, and we have tried to create before. Um, and I, I, I'm, so I'm posing this perhaps more as, as much as just like, a, I wanna make clear that we're, we're not just trying to, we're not ignoring the request. I hear the request. Um, it's very tricky to get there and, um, and I don't think it's an, an easy exercise to get there. I would welcome if Steve, any input that Steve might have about this with regard to this question, because it is, it is a frustration when you look at the state bar discipline system that you, you look at the allegation codes and you say, wow, you're within any one of those allegation codes, it could range from relatively minor um, misconduct to very severe misconduct. And so you can't use those allegation codes as a guide to the severity of misconduct. Is there some other, uh, is there something that I'm not thinking of here that, that might help us um, address this issue of the severity of the cases and the severity of the charges? Perhaps it's the severity of the discipline. Maybe that becomes a proxy, at which point you could say, you know, it's not really about the misconduct per se and how that's defined, it's more about what um, levels of discipline the misconduct fell into ultimately. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, and that's why I sort of mentioned that earlier. I, 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 we don't have, as Dag pointed out, we don't have something. There, first of all, there's no dividing line, felony misdemeanor dividing line. There's no other dividing lines that are similar to that. Uh, the only real dividing line that we have is is the potential length of discipline based on the standards. And so it seems to me that that is the reasonable uh, or, or at least the best way to go um, for now. I know that people in my office are working with uh, people in, in Lisa's office in Oriah to develop a um, allegation categorization plan. Uh, and hopefully that will be done later this year um, that will allow us get it, maybe get us part way there, but it's still not going to be, uh, it, it's really just going to put it in the categories of, okay, is this a, um, you know, is this a misappropriation type of an offense versus, you know, how serious is it? Uh, so I still think that we're going to be back dealing with, um, you know, ultimately the range of discipline being the appropriate way to to handle it. Unfortunately, the standards aren't written up, you know, a violation of this statute or a violation of this rule is this. It's really based on conduct. Um, and so I, I think that's the best thing that we have. Miss Good. I, I was just going to say it doesn't really matter. I mean, if the categorization has to be by the range of conduct, then so be it. You know, great. We just need to categorize these in some way so that we can, um, you know, group them together and make determinations about, you know, certain categories versus others. 
Um, so um, yeah, it, it, does, it does sound difficult and I don't envy uh, Lisa with her categorization project. Uh, but I think that's fine. If that's how we do it, then so be it. Okay. Um, so if my, so the request that I have um, quickly tried to pull out of my notes as I was, um, as we were going through the meeting today, more information on the ceiling records that was about the um, number of petitions and a number of times it was granted. Um, more information on why expungement wasn't used because we only had, you know, a hint one or two. Um, the expungement process, the petition to the state bar court, you know, uh, or not state bar, the Supreme Court and the costs associated with that, any other information on that. Um, the information on consumer alerts for felony charges pending. Um, I will see what information we can get on that, uh, how many times that was done where the um, charges didn't result in conviction. Um, and then um, other states, so to update that um, other states chart where they, what is on their website and for how long. Um, and then what we talked about just now on the levels of discipline on some sort of categorization um, that we'll bring back. And then um, there was a request on um, stipulation versus go to trial information. Um, and then another on the charges with the range of discipline um, is, and I may have other things in my notes, but I was trying to do a couple things at once. If there's anything glaring from this list, um, please let me know. And if you think of it later, you can always email me or you can say it now. Um, I don't know if you have anything else, Lisa. Okay. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for your participation today. I don't have anything more. I have a lot of um, work to do to bring back with you and hopefully um, within the next, uh, I would say by the end of next week, I'll have an idea on how long this will take and then I'll send out a doodle poll um, to gauge your availability for a meeting when appropriate. Um, if, but if there are no other questions, I think we are adjourned. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.